doing well this fine spring morning. Spring's in the air a bit. I like it. I'll take it. A little warmer weather. Nice outside birds chirping as we came in this morning. Hope you got big plans for the day and everything is, is going your way. For the past few weeks, we've kind of taken a topical approach to considering prayer in these Thursday morning sessions. I want us to actually look at a passage this morning. So if you have your copy of God word, God's Word, join me in turning to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. This is a passage we've referred to a few times along the way, but have yet to give any substantive exposition to. So I'd like us to try to do that in the time that we have this morning. What I want to talk to you about this morning is the power of prayer. And I kind of like to say in a provocative way, there is no power in prayer. The power is in the God to whom we pray. But this passage speaks specifically of the power we may access in prayer as we go to God who holds all power in heaven and on earth. And it speaks to some extent of the ways that we avail ourselves of that power. Last week's lesson, we talked about certain hindrances to prayer. There are certain behaviors, certain attitudes that we can give ourselves to that can be a limiting factor in our prayer. Not just in that certain actions and attitudes would prevent us from desiring to spend time with God in prayer, but that in the actual process of prayer, limitations, hindrances might be observed in our prayer life if we give ourselves over to certain actions and attitudes. James 5 fleshes that out a bit and gets a, a bit uh, specific about some ways that we can overcome such hindrances and access the power of God in prayer. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. Read along with me. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church. They should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will restore him to health. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. James begins by describing the various circumstances of life. Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone cheerful? Is, is anyone among you sick? This is pretty much what you got, right? You can be cheerful and glad, things are going smoothly. You can be um, enduring some hardship, suffering. You can be sickly. And in each of the circumstances of life, James prescribes for us prayer and praise as the appropriate response. In times of cheerfulness, we celebrate what God has done. We praise Him. And you may praise in prayer. It is a good thing to go to God in prayerful praise. Prayer oughtn't always be a time when we're concentrated on the list of needs that our life circumstances have generated, but a time that we spend thinking about His goodness toward us. If you think about the models for prayer that you see in the Bible, they always begin with a moment of prayer. And, and I, I think, I think not, they, don't, they not only have the purpose of worshiping God in spirit and in truth in that moment, but of tuning our heart in faith to remember the power and the goodness of the God to whom we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In the model prayer, Jesus begins by acknowledging the otherness of God. Hallowed, holy be thy name. He, he's celebrating the power of the Father to whom he prays. Is any among you suffering? This seems to be a common experience for 
uh, the congregation that lies behind the book of James. James' parishioners seem to have been a people enduring some conflict. He barely begins the book of James before noting, count it all joy, brothers, when you fall into various trials and tribulations. When the hardship comes, count it joy. Look for what God is up to. Surely God has a good plan, a good purpose for you. Under those circumstances, James' prescription is that we should pray. If anyone is sick, he says, he should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. There there are some things about the passage that at first glance are a little mysterious, right? You read the passage and there are a few questions that come to mind. One, what is this business of anointing with olive oil? That's the one that probably stands out most in the minds of Baptists for which this kind of practice is strange and foreign. Two... Is James suggesting that there's a special level of access enjoyed by the elders or the pastors of the church? Those are the two most pressing questions. And there are others that are raised within the text as well. But I would suggest to you that what James is doing in James chapter 5 is not to set the elders above the congregation in terms of the power they stand to enjoy and pray, but to exhort the church as a whole to pray for one another with regards to needs that might come under the category of suffering or of sickness. Sometimes we can take sort of cheap shots at praying for physical needs. Pastors like to say most of our prayer is focused on keeping people out of heaven, not getting people into heaven. What we mean by that is most of our prayer focus is focused on the sick list, you know, and the needs that might arise in our life or whatever our current existing problem of the day is. And it is true that a lot more of our prayer life ought to be focused on getting people into heaven than what in reality it is. We ought to be praying that God would save the lost, that God would open their hearts to receive the message of the gospel, that God would move us to carry the message of the gospel to them. But this is, in general, an exhortation that we pray about the everyday needs that arise within our life and a reminder to us that as ordinary men we may access the power of God in prayer and that often God is pleased to work in this way. Notice specifically the language of the remainder of verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick person And the Lord will restore him to health, or as some of your translations may render more accurately, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The idea, as it seems to me in James 5, of calling for the elders that they should pray over the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up, is is describing a scenario in which The elders are operating as representatives of the body. Notice again, they're praying over the person. The Lord will raise him up as in raise him from the sickbed, raise him to health. This, in my estimation, is describing a scenario where a person is so sickly, they're unable to be in the corporate assembly of the church. And so under those circumstances, because it would be inappropriate inappropriate there for the entire body to attend the bedside of a sickly saint, the elders are to go there as representatives of the body. Pastors don't enjoy any more power in prayer than any other member of the body of Christ. There is one mediator between God and man, and we all have the same mediator between God and man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. So this passage contrary to certain perceptions, is not about certain levels of power enjoyed in prayer. It is a general exhortation to the church that every member of the body of Christ enjoys access to the power of God in prayer if we would but go to God with our every need. Is anyone among you sick? Let's go back. He should call for the elders of the church And they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. I I don't know that I have ever witnessed an actual anointing in a Baptist context. Uh, Well, I take that back. I I have. And I I thought it unique and unusual. And 
I, I was in the, the Applegate Chapel, which is the, the old chapel at First Baptist Starkville, and I was there for a prayer meeting with other pastors, and it, it was an interdenominational gathering of pastors, and someone asked to be prayed for, and, and a Baptist brother just went up and walked, and behind the pulpit was anointing oil, and we anointed our brother and prayed for him, and I thought, I wouldn't have even looked there, one, in a Baptist church, and, and uh, you know, so it, it was just kind of, I didn't know what to make of all that. My understanding, and I'm not angry at anybody who has a different position, I'm not sure that it is a major issue here, is that the anointing oil, as it's described in our passage, has a medicinal function. If I'm correct about that, what James is saying, you want to avail yourself of any natural means or medical means of, of healing. You don't want to limit yourself with that regard. God has very graciously for us given us advancements in medicine and technology that we might leverage for our well-being and overcoming the sicknesses that plague us on an almost, almost constant basis. But, but set in this context, it is a reminder that that ought not ought to be the primary means for us in our pursuit of healing. I had a conversation uh, with a young couple about this passage on yesterday, which I thought was very interesting. And uh, we were talking about some ongoing health issues and uh, whether or not they had experienced any anxiety with a long list of appointments that they'd been making with a variety of specialists trying to sort through these health issues. And they explained that, that rather than there being anxiety about these visits, there had been a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in the hopes that they would find the answer that they'd been looking for, and an answer as to why this was being experienced for them. And we wondered together, the three of us, about whether or not they had enjoyed the same enthusiasm for the medium, the discipline of prayer during this season, given that the God to whom we pray bears far more power than any MD, any medicine, or any advancements in technology. It's, it's always interesting to me to talk to brothers from other places, from third world countries who love Jesus, and to hear how they pray for healing, for the answering of certain needs within their context versus the way we pray for them. There's some subtle things that you'll pick up almost immediately. We tend to pray that God would use natural means in order to bring about our healing. I find that our brothers in other parts of the world just pray that God would heal. And I've also observed that often God is well pleased to answer those prayers prayed in great faith. Now, I'm not calling you, charging you with any kind of mysterious, crazy, farcical kind of approach to your personal health and well-being. Again, if my understanding of this passage is correct, James exhorts us that we leverage the natural means God has afforded us for our well-being in the pursuit of health and strength and stability and remedying the needs that arise within the span of our life. But I am saying to you that your doctor is petty and your prescriptions are small in, compar in comparison to the power of our God. We ought to go to him with the very needs that we have. And you and I have been guilty of this. We do this all the time. We wring our hands in anxiety about the diagnosis or the circumstances of life. It's not just medical issues that arise. There are any number of things that unfold in our life. I've shared with you about our whole foster journey and, and the thoughts begin to turn about where you can go and who you can find influence with and who can, who can push the buttons and pull the levers and make things move. But the reality is that we pray to the God of heaven and earth. And all of this passage serves as a reminder to the church that we must go to him in prayer. In verse 15, the Bible says, the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will restore him to health. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. What is the prayer of faith? Simply put, at least in my estimation, the prayer of faith is a prayer prayed, believing in the power of God to deliver. It, 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 James warns early in the book of James, which is why I'm convinced this is what he intends here, that, a, that, that we ought to, to pray believing. And he cautions against praying in doubt. A, a, a man 
divided in his mind is, is dangerous, James says. But when we go to God in prayer with the right motives, God is pleased to answer those needs. Understand the access you have and the reason you have that access. You know, this is a Thursday morning group. There's certain parts of prayer that perhaps aren't necessary to rehearse. But you only have access to God because of the blood of Jesus. And Jesus sits at the right hand of God praying for us as our intercessor. His blood is your access point to the Father. When we pray believing in Jesus' name, we don't pray in our own power. We don't pray in our own authority. You know, this kind of nebulous concept of prayer where we all pull together and we pray and the power of, of, the, of the group can affect some change or our inner energy or whatever new age, newfangled concepts are floating around out there in the social media world. Th th that's crazy. We pray through the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, accessing the power of Jesus by the grace of God. The prayer of faith, James says, will save the sick. And if he has sinned, his sin will be forgiven. In verse 16, the Bible says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. My understanding of this passage, and I want you to be able to see this, I think if you get the peace of the elders serving as representatives of the body in going to pray over the sick person, as opposed to enjoying this special dose of prayer power, I think you'll get it. But the second piece of the puzzle, the final piece of the puzzle in that perspective on these verses is here in verse 16. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. This is not just elders go pray for some people, lay hands on some people. This is you as a body. Pray for one another specifically because you enjoy access to God through Jesus Christ. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Now, the next line in verse 16 reads, the urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. I was doing some reading last night, looking at a couple of guys and, and their take on this passage. And in both cases, they want to, wanted to soften the weight of what was said here, the prayer of the righteous person. Now, what they were doing was they were trying to, they were trying to make the same point that I'm seeking to make this morning. And then there's not special power for elders, but that power can be enjoyed by the body. And it is true that James is making no attempt whatsoever to create this hierarchy where certain levels of power, or degrees of power are enjoyed in prayer. But there can be no mistaking or misunderstanding what James is clear about here in the last sentence of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We read last week in our conversation on hindrances to prayer, the words of the psalmist who said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayer. What James is saying here is perfectly consistent with other passages in the Bible, which would suggest that in a way that I don't completely comprehend, our power in prayer, the power we stand to access in prayer is limited somehow by the presence of unconfessed sin in our lives personally. Brothers, if you are to enjoy access to the fullness of power God intends for you in prayer, you must confess your sins to God and repent of them with great haste. There have been a few times I, I could take you to the, to the house, I could take you to the street, I could take you to, to where I was stopped in the road and given consideration to this very verse. There have been a few times when I felt as though there was unconfessed sin in my life that served as an obstacle, a hindrance in the, in the power that I stood to enjoy in prayer and, and evangelism and the powerlessness that I felt in, in the moment. I, 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 could, I could take you there to that place. 
And as so far as I know, the, the individual with whom I shared the message of the gospel with on that day, who I wanted so earnestly to come to faith in Jesus, perished in his sin. James says, when we have cleared our hearts of unconfessed sin, when there is an abiding in Christ and his abiding in us, there is the power of prayer and that we access the God of heaven. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. I think this works in a couple of ways. One, we distance ourselves from God in giving ourselves over to sin. And so as we grasp for him, although he is as near as our mouth, there is this sense of distance between us and the God of, of heaven. I don't understand all of the ins and outs of how that works, but you've experienced it personally. You drift over time and there just isn't that sense of nearness that there once was for you. And then God in his discipline, in his chastisement, may withhold certain blessings from us in order to woo and to win us back, to remind us of his favor toward us and how deeply we need him every moment of our life. However you understand it, hear clearly James' exhortation to us that the urgent request of a man deeply committed to righteousness is very powerful in its effect. Verse 17, James sort of comes back to what I think the spirit of the passage is, which is again to say there aren't certain men that enjoy certain levels of power, but we all, as the body of Christ, enjoy the benefit of prayer, the power of prayer, because the power is not about us. The power is about the God to whom we pray. He says here, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now, he's not citing Elijah to, to further advance the message of that last sentence in verse 16 in my estimation. He's not saying... Elijah was especially righteous, and so Elijah enjoyed a double portion of power in prayer. That seems to be counterproductive to the point that he's making in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah was like us. Elijah is like us. Elijah had strengths, and Elijah had weaknesses. Elijah had fits of great victory, and Elijah had fits of despair. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Elijah was a man like me and you, but he prayed earnestly, and God stopped the sky. And then there came an appointed time when Elijah prayed yet again that the rains would come, and indeed, they did. The point here is that this is the kind of power that you have access to in prayer. Now, here's what I would remind you of with regards to Elijah's prayer. He's praying as he's prompted by the Lord, not for some delightful weather forecast, right? This is not Elijah has a beach vacation lined up and he says, Lord, I've really spent a lot of money and I'm really looking forward to some great time away with my family. Could you please stop the heavens for me? This is Elijah praying as it would accord with the will of God. I need to be careful that it's not arbitrary things. This is not a word of faith movement moment for us this Thursday morning at Longview Point. The idea that you can name it and claim it, blab it and grab it is just not biblical. But there is power we have access to as the body of Christ when we pray that God's will would unfold in our life, that he would be pleased to use us as a part of the fulfillment of that will. I believe with all of my heart that God is often pleased to answer that prayer. There are things we know to be the will of God, the salvation of souls, the advancement of the kingdom. Th there are then those areas we might not be entirely certain about. There are times when I say, God, I don't know what you want to do in this situation, but I'll, I'll be happy with it if you'll be pleased to do it. And so I ask that you would allow that this would be the turn of events. You don't know when you get a bad diagnosis if it's God's will if you, that you're going to be healed or not. It may be that 
God's will is that his glory would be expressed and you're bearing with a joyful heart the diagnosis that has been issued. We don't, there are areas we don't know, but you can evaluate your heart in those moments and know how to best pray. Like if it's the beach vacation weather forecast, well, that's worldly and, and probably not the thing that you want to bombard heaven over, right? If it's you, you want something that serves your personal interest that doesn't have eternal value. These are not the kind of things that James is exhorting us to pray about. But with anything and everything, as it relates to our well-being and the advancement of the kingdom, the salvation of souls, James' word is, you don't need an elder, a pastor, or a priest. You, you men, with a nature like Elijah's, with certain strengths and certain weaknesses, through the blood of Jesus, you have access to the God of heaven. To him, you may go in prayer. If I ask you this morning, what's the main ingredient in prayer? What would your response be? What, what, is, what is the part of prayer that we just cannot do without? i share a little quote from an article titled the main ingredient of prayer we pray as ordinary people who have an extraordinary god we're just normal you and i we're just normal like elijah prayer is effective not because of great men who pray but because of a great god who in christ graciously hears his people he's the main ingredient pray as you pray today remember who it is you pray to and focus on his goodness his glory and his power often we just sort of zone out and the focus is the problem we bring to god but maybe today we make god the focal point of our prayer and we trust that he's the deliverer who holds all authority both in heaven and in earth let's go to him now in prayer Father, thank you for your word, for prayer as a means of fellowship with you. God, I pray that as we come to you in prayer now and throughout the day, that you would remind us of your greatness, of your goodness, of your glory and your power. Help us, Lord, with eyes of faith to see you. As needs arise in our life, Lord, help us to know how to best pray. And help us, God, to guard ourselves against praying for selfish things, for things that only serve our earthly interests but have no eternal value. Lord, as we pray, I, I, I would ask that you would bend our hearts toward heaven, that your desires would be our desires. I pray, God, that you would reveal to us even our secret sin, that we might confess our sins before you and receive the grace and forgiveness that is freely issued by the blood of Jesus. I pray, God, that you'd give us men in our life, Lord, friends and close brothers to whom we might likewise confess our sins, that we could seek their assistance in prayer and that we likewise could pray for them. God, give us those kinds of friends as men. God, I pray for the many needs that are represented here in this room. They are many. Health needs and needs as they relate to children and grandchildren. Concerns for, for wives and, and marriages, God. Custody arrangements and adoption placements, Lord, and infertility struggles. There are so many needs in this room likened to the needs that James exhorts us to pray for. So God, I pray that you would forgive us of our tendency to, to run to worldly solutions to problems that are well beneath your feet. God, I pray that you would give us great faith that we might come to you with the prayer of faith that would prevail in our circumstance. God, I pray that that when our hearts are anxious, when we're worrying about things that are well beyond our control, that you would still our soul by your Holy Spirit, 
remind us of your authority over our life and over all things. And move us, God, in those moments to quietly come to you with confident faith, trusting your will for us. God, I I pray for the members of our body, uh, those who are sickly, those who are unable to be here with us as a body. Pray, God, that you would bring healing to their life, Lord, that you would bring healing in in, in every case as you'd be pleased, God. And, And Lord, where you have other designs where your plan looks different than that. I I pray that you'd grant a portion of contentment and satisfaction with your perfect will for us. I pray, God, that you would help us to be, by your standard, righteous men and remind us this day and every day to come of the great power afforded us through the discipline of prayer. God, you are good, worthy of all worship and praise. We offer these petitions to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentlemen, have a great day at work today. Tell someone about Jesus.